Hi, and welcome to Programming Like It's 1979 from NAND Tetris. In our last video, we left off by describing one basic outline of how to write an assembler. Contained within that outline was a pretty tricky concept, the symbol table. Some of you have asked me to expand upon this, so this video is all about the symbol table, which is to say it's about labels and names in assembly language and how to implement them in your assembler. There are a few complicated concepts here, so let's walk through them one at a time. To explain this, we're going to return to our simplest assembly language program, mult.asm, which multiplies two numbers together. You'll find this in your NAND to Tetris directory, Projects 04 Mult. This program already has symbols and labels in it. Let's highlight them here. Everything highlighted in red is a symbol that has to be in our symbol table. Our assembler is going to replace these human readable symbols with the appropriate integers. Some of these are given to us by the book. So the first step of building your symbol table, in fact, is going to be to simply populate it with these predefined values. But when I say populate it, what do I mean? Well, in fact, on almost any programming language, we're going to have a structure such as a dictionary or a hash map or a mapping function that maps from one thing to another. And that's going to, we're going to use whatever structure makes sense in the programming language you've chosen to hardwire, for example, the string R0 to the number zero, the string this, to the number three, and so on. As an example, let's take this assembly language program and de-symbolify it by hand. So, for example, we know from the book that the symbol R0 refers to address zero in RAM, R1 to one, so let's go ahead and replace those. Boom. The other items are a bit trickier though. What do those mean, the ones that aren't referenced in the book? Well, let me bring in some line numbers to make explaining this easier. The items that you see here, other than the at two, at one, at zero, are labels. And in this program, those labels exist in two contexts, a definition and a use. So for example, at line two, you see the word loop in parentheses, that's a definition. That's saying that this label loop represents a certain location in program memory. In this case, it happens to be two. The label represents the location in program memory as if that's the only label in the program. That sounds confusing. We're gonna come back to it a little bit later. Then if you look at line 13, you can see we are putting loop into the A register and that's a use context. So right away, we hit one of the three complicated bits with labels. Don't we already have a number two? That R2 register, which was referenced on line nine, was also two. How can our labels be the same as the registers? Isn't that a collision? Well, a detail of the hack computer implementation makes this not a collision. Let's talk about it. Here is a diagram we used in our CPU class. On a modern computer, you would assume that your program was sitting somewhere in the RAM memory. It might look a little bit like this. This is how almost all computers work. We call this the von Neumann architecture. When you run a program, it's loaded into RAM memory and it shares the same physical space in electronic terms as your data, although hopefully you're not actually clobbering one of them with the other. But the hack CPU is not really a von Neumann architecture machine. It's much more like what's called a Harvard architecture machine. This architecture has completely separate memory address spaces for instructions versus data. In the hack CPU, the instruction memory is held in a 15K ROM or read-only memory, while the data is in RAM. Since each of these has their own independent address space, the number zero in one space is completely different from the number zero in another. 
on von Neumann machines, we can achieve a similar conceptual separation by using a concept called virtualized address spaces. But that's beyond the, the scope of this video and in fact of the NAND to Tetris course. Returning to our example program, let's recolor our instruction labels accordingly to make this clear. Now our labels are purple and our registers are red. So understanding RAM versus ROM is one complication of the labels. Another one is that the label definition line itself isn't really part of the program. So for example, when we look at this loop label, we can see that it's at line two of the program. We call this a pseudo instruction. So at line 13, when we say put loop in the A register, we're really saying put the number two in the A register, but the label itself at line two is not actually part of our program. So as the CPU understands it, so we need to remove it. But now look what happened. Every line after the label just moved up by one line. So previously our end label would have been at line 15, by a naive count, but now it's at line 14. How do we keep track of this? I'm gonna go with the book's recommendation, which is to make your assembler a two-pass assembler. On the first pass, you march through the program, but you don't generate any code. All you're doing is keeping account of every real instruction you encounter, and when you hit a pseudo instruction, its address is at the count you're at, and you stuff that address count relationship, or excuse me, that label count relationship into your symbol table. On the second pass, you actually generate code, substituting symbol table lookup results for symbols as you encounter them, and just drop the pseudo instructions completely. This two-pass structure also automatically handles the third complication we see here at lines four and 14, which is that a symbol can be referenced before its label is defined. So we will create our symbol table on the first pass when the program looks like this. And then our second pass will, using the symbol table created in pass one, transform our program into this. There is one other detail, which is variable symbols. You can create arbitrary names to be used as variables. Unlike label symbols, these refer to RAM, not ROM. The specification indicates that variables are allocated as they're encountered in line number order and begin allocating at RAM address 16. When one variable symbol is assigned, you increment a counter to keep track of where the next one should be assigned. And that's what I wanted to say to you about symbol tables. Hopefully I've given you enough insight that you can go off and implement them yourself without giving away the entire game or actually writing code for you. Uh, I hope your assembler goes swimmingly. If you have questions or comments or other topics you'd like me to drill down on, please say something in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. And lastly, our channel has grown largely through word of mouth. So when you tell friends about it, it really helps us out. Thank you so much. This has been Programming Like It's 1979. Thanks for watching. In the early days of computing, there was a language barrier between computers and humans because you had to use machine language if you wanted to talk to the computer, either in binary code or its exact English equivalent. This was very slow and laborious. Every time a generalist wanted to tell the computer to print something, or make a decision, or repeat an operation, he had to break every statement down into tiny electronic steps. The same for the mathematician who had to translate all his math symbols into long-winded computer talk. And even the businessman who just wanted to do payrolls and inventories and make out bills to his customers had to spell everything out in nitpicking machine language. But eventually, after a number of years, people began to realize that they were translating the same fundamental ideas into machine language over and over again. <laughs>